Okay, well, I've put the record button on <laughs> to um, to start the event, and um, I'm hoping everyone can see and hear me okay. Um, please let me know if you can't. Um, I just want to ask you, please, because uh, I think we'll be a, a big uh, crowd, um, and if you could make sure to to mute uh, during the talk um, and when you're not speaking yourself, that would be great. I've also put the live captions on, which you can access if you wish, um, so that's entirely your choice. OK, well, welcome everyone to the Centre for Visual Cultures at Royal Holloway. Um, I'm aware that there are many of you, in fact, who um, are not from the college, who are uh, guests from, I think, around the country. Um, and I want to say a special hello to the um, Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Centre at the University of Huddersfield, who were in touch earlier this week. Um, it's great to have you here. And I believe also members of Hillary's family uh, are also here, which uh, is great. So welcome, everyone. I'm the director of the centre, James Williams. And uh, it's uh, great to welcome you to this 20, 78th anniversary talk of the um, Rosenstrasse protest in Berlin in 1943. Um, for those who don't know Hillary, um, I'm going to just do a short introduction. Uh, Dr. Hilary Potter is a teaching fellow in German in the School of Humanities up here at Royal Holloway. Before that, she worked at the Universities of Cardiff, Leeds and Newcastle. She's the author of the monograph uh, Remembering Rosenstrasse, History, Memory and Identity in Contemporary Germany, published by Peter Lang in 2018. She's currently working on an exhibition with Mark Epstein of Edge Hill University, who is here. Welcome, Mark, entitled Weimar 1919 to 1933, Dancing on a Volcano, exploring the resonances between the present and Germany's first democracy. Uh, she's also working on the transnational TV series Babylon Berlin, uh, about which she spoke, in fact, at a talk last night <laughs> at the Department of Languages, Literature, Cultures here at Holloway and two articles I believe are in production on that project. So welcome Hilary and welcome also to Simone Giliotti who has very kindly agreed to lead the Q&A. Uh, Dr Simone Giliotti is Senior Lecturer in Holocaust Studies here uh, in the School of Humanities and is affiliated with the Holocaust Research Institute. She, well, her research focuses uh, on the victim and survivor uh, experience in oral, written, visual and geographic accounts and how these accounts often intersect with and differ from perpetrator, humanitarian and other witnessing perspectives. She's the author of the uh, landmark uh, monograph, A Train Journey, Transit, Captivity and Witnessing in the Holocaust, published by Berg Hahn in 2009, and is the editor, co-editor of numerous volumes, and I just mentioned a few, uh, The Young Victims of the Nazi Regime, Migration, migration, uh, The Holocaust and Post-War Displacement, Bloomsbury 2016, The Memorialization of Genocide, Routledge 2017, and most recently, uh, I think these were both last year, um, the Blackwell Companion to the Holocaust and the Holocaust in the 21st Century Relevance and Challenges in the Digital Age, published by Northwestern University Press. So it's a great pleasure to have both Hilary and uh, Simone here and all of you um, to be part of this anniversary talk. Um, and the title of the talk is Visualizing Panopsistic Memories of the Berlin Rosenstrasse Protest, 1943, through the medium of photography. Over to you, Hilary. Thank you, James. I'd also like to extend my welcome and thank you for coming today. And I'd like to extend my thanks to Mark Epstein, my partner in crime and all other things. Um, but also he's a tutor at Edge Hill and also a professional photographer. And we have him to thank for the fact that this PowerPoint got put together so well. He's been tremendously helpful. And the fact that I'm here in one piece because he made lunch while I was busy 
trying to get everything together at the last minute because it's been a slightly hectic week. Before I bring, begin talking about this, this topic of the Rosenstrasse protest and its commemoration, its memorialization, I'd like to first um, begin by welcoming Trudy and Danny, if he's here, because I'm, if I can make my PowerPoint work, um, I'm dedicating this lecture uh, to the memory of Professor Ian Wallace, who was a great scholar, an expert in the GDR, and an all-round lovely human being who sadly passed away recently. He was known to many of us in German studies and he helped launch more than a few academic careers in his time. He was my lecturer and my personal tutor in my undergraduate days, and up, up until his retirement, that is. But he remained in contact, heartily encouraged my research, and even read the book proposal and an early draft of the manuscript for the book, um, which, um, which sort of this lecture is partly, partly based. Ian was always kind, generous uh, with his knowledge. He was supportive and encouraging. He had a knack of reassuring anxious undergrad students about their exam performance, for example. He'd let them know the paper he'd just read was good. And you could tell by the twinkle in his eye and the raising of the eyebrows that he was talking about yours. As well as being generous and insightful, he he was humorous at every given opportunity. I always remember him as smiling. I can't think of an occasion when he didn't. So it seems only fitting that in his memory, we aspire to emulate the kindness, the generosity, the encouragement and the humor wherever possible. And let's let that be a fitting legacy. Thank you very much. So taking that forward and being generous with my knowledge, let's begin our topic for today. Why are we talking about Rosenstrasse now and why photography? Rosenstrasse is a seemingly insignificant side street in central Berlin. And 78 years ago, almost to the day, Saturday in fact, there began in that street what became known as the Rosenstrasse protest. This was a protest against the arrest and feared deportation of somewhere around 2,000 intermarried German Jews, that is, individuals who are of Jewish heritage, or as the Nazis define them, Jewish heritage, because Nazi definition of what who was Jewish differs from Jewish theology. So individual German Jews who are married to Christian or atheist Germans, and also those of mixed Judeo-Christian parentage who the Nazis termed Mischlinger. It's a derogative, uh, a derogatory term to, de to, to describe the fact that they came, came from a mixed background. Supposedly, those who were intermarried or who came from a mixed Judeo-Christian heritage were exempt from deportation. They weren't exempt from persecution, but apparently, well, according to the rules or the, according to what the Nazis said, they wouldn't deport, deport them. But there remained question marks over whether this would actually um, be the case or whether some would be deported anyway and it remained disputed for the entirety of the Third Reich with certain key Nazi figures who wanted to forcibly um, break intermarriages and deport all German Jews but it didn't in fact happen. During this protest the pre predominantly we're talking about women being pr protesting on the street. It wasn't an exclusively female demonstration but it was predominantly female, owing to the makeup of the number of intermarriages in Germany that tend, at that time tended to be a Jewish man married to a non-Jewish woman. Um, but there were also men held in Rosenstrasse and men amongst the protesters. Now, these arrests did not happen in isolation. They were part of a wider, what was known as a roundup or a razzia, of Berlin Jews who had up until that point been used as slave, slave laborers, predominantly in the armaments factories. Um, but the pe people that were held in Rosenstrasse, those who were intermarried, were held separately for the most part. And they were held in a former office building that once belonged to the Jewish community on Rosenstrasse, which is in the center of Berlin. And I will show you where it is in a minute. Um, now, there are many things that are disputed about this protest, not least its form. Some testimonies claim that there was chanting, 
and demanding. Others claimed it was silent or near silent, that people were just gathered there, not knowing what to do. Other testimonies yet still claimed that the protesters were threatened with violence if they didn't, didn't leave the street. We don't know, and it's much disputed, whether the protest was successful. Um, and in many ways, it doesn't matter whether it was successful or not. Success isn't really a measure here for judging, for judging and assessing the protest. But what is known, and what we do know for certain, is that all of the deta detainees were, I say, released. That doesn't mean that they were free. They actually, for the most part, continued as slave or forced laborers in and around Berlin. But they were not deported, save for 25 men who were initially deported to the labor camp at Auschwitz, but a fortnight later transferred back, not to freedom, but to another camp out on the outskirts of Berlin, where they served as forced laborers until the end of the war, but were, their wives were permitted access to go and visit them. There are also a minority of what were called Klärungsfällen. So these were what they call cases where the intermarriage might have been breaking down. And had the marriage broken down, the Nazis would have deported the Jewish individual. Um, so some of these people were detained for up to six weeks, and the most famous being the publicist Heinz Ullstein of the Ullstein Verlag. But the majority of the people in Rosen, detained in the Rosenstrasse were released within a few days to a week. And the protests sort of ebbed and thro flowed throughout this this time it is obviously overnight it was smaller but it it grew in size in the day and it remained constant for that week the vast majority then of the people detained in Rosenstrasse survived the third reich some went into hiding in the latter stages of the war but the majority survived and the protesters never uh, faced any action for the protest which was of course illegal in nazi germany at the time now Patterns of remembrance. What happened after the war? Was this simply forgotten? In all honesty, remembrance of the protesters ebbed and flowed over time. There was initially some interest in it in 1945 and in the years following, but then it sort of declined as other historical narratives took over. And it was then largely forgotten until the 1980s and then more so from the 1990s. And what's interesting in particular is a lot of the impetus to remember the events came from what was then the GDR, what was the, then East Germany. And um, I'll talk a little bit about, more about that as we go through this, as we go through this talk and talk about the memorials. And in the years since then, this has become, Rosenstrasse has become a central um, point of remembrance at this time of year and is now a, an annual point in the commemorative calendar. Now, ordinarily, at some point in the next few days, there would be a ceremony in the street with prayers and speeches. But obviously this year with the pandemic, that's not possible. But there is a virtual ceremony and later on, I'll put a link to that in the chat. It's starting at, well, 10 o'clock German time tomorrow, nine o'clock our time. So if you're up and you can um, understand German and want to watch it, you'll be able to do so to watch it live. And I'm gonna try and watch it live as well because I've never actually been present at the ceremony and I would be really fascinated to see what happens. So then why does talking about this past matter? Why does understanding history matter? I would say it is about understanding the process, the processes, how history is made, who shapes it, why and to what ends, what is forgotten and what is remembered anew. Understanding the process of history means we can understand about the priorities of contemporary society the values that matter now. It can also keep us alert, help us to recognize patterns and look for and spot any recurrence of the past of fascism, however tangential they may be, but they may be in our midst. And part of that is looking at memorialization because for as much as memorials are seemingly fixed, immovable objects, in fact, that's not the case, um, their relevance changes, as does their engagement with them. And we might think of the recent toppling of Edward Coulson's memorial statue as an example of how impermanent a memorial actually is. 
Also, memorials, and I'm using this term um, as an umbrella term because in German there are different terms for, for different types of memorials, and we'll come to that in the Q&A. Uh, memorials don't have just one meaning. They can be interpreted in different ways and at different times and to different ends. And in fact, the um, Holocaust uh, scholar James E. Young talks about the monument or the memorial as being actually the, the best memorial to the Holocaust is actually talking. It is not something hewn out of stone. Also, memorials allow us to see moments captured in time. And this is partly where the photography comes in as well, because I'll get you to think about how memor the memorials that we're looking at this afternoon are not only representative of the past, but that they can also speak to the here and now. You've got to hang into the end for that bit. So lastly then, for this section at least, why photography? Several reasons, not just because CVC asked me to give a lecture and I thought, what can I do? But that obviously is part of it. But why photography? Well, several reasons really. We're going to be using photography as the means today of taking you to Berlin. We're going to use, I'm going to use some screen grabs of maps just to give you some orientation, some digitized archive images to sort of give you a historical sense of Rosenstrasse and a number of recent photographs, some from 2016 and some from 2020. They're mostly Mark, so we also we must thank Mark for letting us use his photos. And a few of them are mine. And so this is how we hadn't envisaged when we took these photos last January that we would be using them for this purpose. We just took them out of out of interest. But we're hoping that I'm going to be able to sort of walk you around the memorials um, through the medium of photography. But that's not the only reason why we're using photography today, because photographs also play a legitimizing role in historical narratives and in this narrative in particular. Even though actually, and ironically, there's no known photograph of the Rosenstrasse protest. There are rumours that one exists, but none has ever been found. But as you'll see, as you look at some of the memorials, photographs are central. Photographs can also help us challenge as, as, um, accepted aspects of the narrative. And again, we'll, we'll talk through some of that in the Q&A because I don't want to dive too deep into the details just yet. Then, of course, there are questions of ethics, of how photographs are used, the ethics of creating an idea of a truth, um, because photographs are believed. There's that old saying of the camera never lies. And I know we've got photography students in on this call who will say, actually, no, sometimes the camera does. Or perhaps that the camera or the photograph derives its meaning from the text and the context in which it is set. So there are ethical questions about usage of photography. And of course, then there's a question of photographic agency, of how photographs are used and how the individual interacts with them, that they help to make a connection, help you imagine what it might have been like at that time. And that is particularly how they're used in some of the um, memorial and the exhibition in particular. So the photos are going to help us trace the multiple histories in this street not just the protest itself, but the history is going back through time and then forwards through time since the protest. We'll look at the history of the protest remembrance through photography. And we'll examine in particular the memorial sculpture, looking for the forgotten or hidden stories within it. What do we see? What don't we see? And then towards the end, we've got a number of photos that are snapshots in time that perhaps tell us something about contemporary Germany or raise questions at least. And so um, we'll be using those as our jumping off point for our discussion, but we're using them gen photos generally with the idea of the urban palimpsest. Now the palimpsest might be a new term to you. Basically what it means in its original form, a palimpsest is the traces of writing. So if you imagine an old manuscript and you can see writing, but underneath you can see faint writing of, of an earlier time. So writing that is has been written over and over and over, but you can trace it back by examining it. You can do the same thing with a cityscape or indeed a street. You can look at the different histories that are present in that one particular urban space and look, well, look to see what you can find. So that's the sort of broad sweep of how this lecture is going to go, how this story is going to go.
Um, do feel free to put questions in the chat. In the meantime, Mark's also helpfully monitoring the chat as best he can. Um, and we will come to sort of questions um, in, as, as we sort of get there. And I'm going to set you a few tasks, a few things to think about as I'm talking. But first of all, I'm going to take a sip of water. But let me try and transport you to Berlin. At this moment in time, still in lockdown, um, I, people might have itchy feet. And I know it, I would really quite like to go to Gorsenstrasse in person right now and to Berlin, um, but I can't. But let's just imagine for a second we're in Berlin. This is Rosenstrasse. The building you see in the background may look like a historical building. In actual fact, it's a rebuild from the 1990s to look like something from around the 1800s, but more on that later, perhaps. What you can see here, and actually I apologize, it looks incredibly small on this computer. It didn't when I was making it, is a screen grab of a Berlin, courtesy of a Berlin map, courtesy of Google. Thank you, Google. And I'm showing you this just to give you a sense of how central central Rosenstrasse is. So for those of you that are familiar with Berlin, you might already be picking out some of the landmarks. But if you look sort of to the left hand side by the green space, um, you can see the Brandenburg Gate, the iconic symbol of Berlin. If you take a short walk, by which I mean a couple of kilometers towards the east and to the perhaps more more well-known Alexanderplatz, the big square in the east, the big TV tower. And just over the road from there is Rosenstrasse. So it really is central Berlin. And here's another perspective for you to look at, this time courtesy of a satellite image, again, courtesy of Google. Um, so we're right there in sort of east Berlin with our TV tower, so subsequent, subsequently there. But if you look to the bottom, Bottom left quarter of that image, you can see the Marienkirche, the church down there. Back at the time of the protest, Rosenstrasse was a much longer street. It had a tram line running down it as well, and it reached almost to that church's the church doors. But after the reconstruction of East Berlin, um, the street was substantially shortened. But just it just gives you a perspective of how big or rather small it was, but also how central. And the building that we're talking about is no longer there. It was bombed, but it's just on the sort of middle corner of that picture on the left hand side. Middle corner? The middle on the left hand side um, of that picture is where it would be. And the memorial we're talking about is just there on the left in the middle. But I grant you that is really teeny tiny. I don't imagine you can see it um, on the screen. But let's go from our bird's eye view down to the ground. You've also just traveled back to May 2016. Um, and what you can see here is Rosenstrasse as it is, or as it was four years ago. Behind those trees is the building or the site of the building that um, was the, the center of this, this protest, the former Jewish community building. It's now been rebuilt and as an office, as, as an office block. And the only original building on that street is just at the end, number one, it's now, now a hotel where you see the trees, that's approximately where Berlin's first synagogue stood. It was technically on Heide Reutergasse, which is an adjacent street, but cornered with Rosenstrasse. So we're in the heart of Berlin and we're in the heart of Jewish Berlin. And this is a sketch of the said synagogue, consecrated in, 19, uh, not 19, in 1714, my apologies. Um, and it became known as the Alta Synagogue or the Old Synagogue um, once the much larger synagogue opened in Oranienburger Straße, a few streets away. However, it remained a house of worship until 1942, until the Nazis closed it. It was bombed at some point in the latter stages of the war and for about 20 years it remained an empty shell. When it, and then it was then pulled down in some time in the 60s to make way for that urban replanning um, in, in, in the GDR times. And that area was actually left as pretty much a kind of disused green space, which is, well, I'll get to why the memorial is where it is shortly. And now you've gone back further in time, and we're at 1896. And this is a photograph by the, by the photographer Georg Bartels. And this is Rosenstrasse, 
as similar to the way it would have been when the protest took place. The building where the detainees were held, where the, the intermarried German Jews were held, it was this one here. So if you go to the right hand side of the screen and three rooftops in, that is the building there. And again, you can see it's a very narrow, very narrow street. So try and imagine that rammed with people, people inside the building and people outside the building to give you a sense of how crowded this protest must have been. And this is the final of my archive, archive shots. This is um, the building on Wozenstrasse, sort of in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Interestingly, this photograph was taken by a photographer called um, Abraham Pisarek, who subsequently ended up as one of the detainees within that building and then later survived the war. And it's thanks to his daughter that we have access to this photograph. Now, what you see in there, right on the, the right hand side of the image and a further one sort of sort of left of centre in the image, are two columns known as Litfass Soylen after Ernst Litfass, who, who created them, they're advertising columns. So normally they would have posters, advertising, shows or whatever pasted on them. In testimonies of the protest then, um, these Litfass soil and these columns appear, particularly when children, who, people who have been children at the time of the protest were recounting their memories and they talk about hiding behind them. So looking up to the windows without the guards seeing them, trying to catch a glimpse of their mother or their father. Um, detained within the building. And this photograph has been reused and reused and become synonymous with the protest, but also those columns um, play an important role because one of the memorials we'll look at is based on that column. It takes that idea and that association with those columns and the testimony as its, as its form for a basic exhibition in the street today. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little while. So, Hopefully you're now feeling a little bit sort of more orientated uh, into, into Berlin and into Rosenstrasse. And I'd like to begin talking about the first of the memorials to the, to the protest, as we call it. And um, I'll just give you a bit of background and then I'm going to walk you through it, but not say too much because I want you to be thinking and viewing and not to try and overly steer your interpretations, because I'm going to tell you what I think afterwards. Now, the sculpture was created by Ingeborg Hunzinger, um, a renowned artist and sculptor in East Germany. Um, she had a complicated relationship with the East German state. She was quite critical of it. At times, she was given quite a lot of artistic freedom. Other times, she was more restricted. But latterly, in the latter years of the, the the GDR, she had become quite critical of the state and particularly the absence of any memorial to the Holocaust Jewish suffering. Now, at the same time, what was going on in the GDR is there was, a, there was actually a turn towards looking at, at the GDR's Nazi past, its Jewish past, um, for varying reasons. And I think just conscious of time, I won't go them in, into them here, but I'll talk about those um, in the Q&A later. But there was a with this interest that was building in uh, into the, the Nazi past, um, there was a greater sort of reception at state level for projects around sort of that, that engaged with Jewish history. And Ingeborg Hunsinger put forward a project for the sculpture, which received funding in the summer of 1989. So you know, kind of get what I'm thinking. This is not long before the states or the, the, the demise, should we say, the fall of the Berlin Wall obviously Germany's unification a year later in 1990. So what happened to the sculpture? Was it, obviously it was realized, but therein lies a bit of a battle. Hunsinger had created her sculpture, but for several years, sort of getting it actually on site was a struggle and looked like it might not happen. Ingeborg Hunsinger did not want her sculpture to be hidden out of sight. She wanted it on display in for the public, but also to jolt the public and make them think and make them question and recognise this Nazi past and the Jewish past. Now, once Germany was unified, various laws came into being, um, which meant that the ground where Ingeborg Hunsinger has ultimately been able to display the sculpture reverted to its original ownership of the Jewish community. 
And at, in the early 1990s, the Jewish community were thinking about how they could use this space. And they wanted to put a, put a building on there, so perhaps, perhaps an old people's home. Um, but ultimately, and they offered um, Ingo Hunksen the chance to put her memorial sculpture in a sort of central little courtyard bit, but she didn't want it um, to be out of, out of sight of the general public. Ultimately, though, the Jewish community gifted the land to the city of Berlin because of building regulations. When you come to look at the photos, what you will see is that all around that area, there's high rise buildings sort of in there. And they're, some of them are office buildings, but there's also sort of ordinary dwellings. And any building in that space would have restricted light to those flats, which meant that nothing could be built on there. So the Jewish community decided to gift the land to the city and Ingeborg Hunsinger was then able to put her or have her sculpture installed on what was the site of the former synagogue. And that, that all happened in October 1995. So we kind of think that, you know, what we remember about the past is always sort of political. And to a certain extent, there is a lot of political involvement in the installation of a memorial. But what we remember, or what we are able to remember and have, have recognised, sometimes comes down to sort of the, the, the smallest of details that you wouldn't imagine. But because of those small details, we are able to recognise this part of Germany's past. And Ingeborg Hunsinger's sculpture has ultimately provided a gateway for all the memorials that, and initiatives that have followed. So you'd, I'm sure you'd now like to see it. Hang on, my screen's frozen. Perfect timing. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slowly click you through these. I'm going to give you a few pointers for things to think about, sort of drill down into the photos so that you can pick up on things. But I'd also, I'm not going to talk too much because I would like you to start drawing your own impressions and then we can really bring those out in the Q&A. But this um, memorial sculpture, just a couple of sort of factual details. Um, it's made out of a stone called red porphyry, which erodes gradually over time. And it's in five blocks, in five sections, should we say, or blocks, because it's called a block der Frauen or the women's block. And these are spread across the, the, the sort of the green space, the former the land of the former synagogue. And I'm going to just move through them sort of left to right for no other reason than that's just you've got to look at it one way or the other. So we're going to start on the left hand side nearest Alexanderplatz. And the first block that we come to, we see a musician. Note that the violin he's holding in the one hand appears broken, disjointed, as does the bow in his other hand. Look at his face. Look at his gaze. Where is he looking? What does that impression tell you? Look again. This is just a profile view of him looking. Where is his gaze going? Oh, um, someone else has taken control of the presentation. I'm going to take it back. Can you please not do that because it will cause it to crash? Look at where. So look at where he's, he's looking. What does that expression say to you? What does it make you think of? This is the reverse of that same block. So you can see it's quite small and, uh, and, and sort of oddly shaped in one respect. And we have this depiction here of what is perhaps um, a, well, it's, it's said to be a depiction of Babylonian exile. So we've got the contemporary persecution, but then um, tied in with the long ancient history of Jewish persecution. And if we zoom in, we can see that face. What does that face say to you, that holding the head in the hands? What does it perhaps remind you of? If we come back to the other side of the that little block, we've got a man bending over. He seems to have a book in his hand, but his head is resting and his gaze is looking away. In actual fact, it's looking away from the entire sculpture. It's looking towards the other street. That is supposed to be a philosopher. So why is the philosopher looking away um, from what's going on? 
what does that say to us? Now we come to the central blocks and you'll notice that there's quite a lot of green, there's sort of like a lot of moss and algae and whatever on them, and I'll talk about why in a minute. But we can see various sort of Jewish symbolism symbols here and various different scenes that are going on, and we're going to look at them a little more closely. If we come to this end, we have the shrouded figure. We can deduce that this is a Jewish figure by the star that's above it, and the figure is shrouded and all we know, we can see, we can see the eyes and the hands, but there's no other way of determining the gender of this particular figure. Um, but we we into we intuit that this is about about death, about loss of Jewish life. If we come to the reverse, take a look at the top of that block and down on the left hand side. If you look closely, again, we've got repeated motifs. But also it looks as if these sections are perhaps ornate, but look again more closely and they look like they're broken bits, perhaps from other buildings. Perhaps this is symbolising um, the destruction of Jewish property. And then we come to the couple here. They look as if they're hewn out of the one stone, what the same stone. What does that represent? What does that symbolise? Then if we move to the right hand side, we've got a number of bodies squashed together in a very confined space. They're all at different angles and we've got a very small figure, perhaps a child or a small person at the bottom. What does this all represent? And if we look in more closely, we can see the agonizing look on their faces. This one here being squashed. There's, a, there's an arm potentially here and a head here. What? What is it making, asking the viewer or the visitor to think of? This then is the, the side of the block and you'll notice it's very jagged, but unnaturally so. This isn't the result of a natural erosion. It's as if someone has taken, I don't know, a sledgehammer to it and broken it up. It's an unnatural break. What it was Hunsinger trying to suggest with this? I'm not saying I have all the answers. This is just things for you to think about and we can discuss. I have some suggestions, obviously. Then we come to this block. We've got what we believe are the protesters um, huddled together, looking in different directions. Their faces of exhaustion, perhaps, of anguish, of sorrow, of uncertainty, of shock. We've got the woman with her mouth open there. And their gaze, where is their gaze going at this point? What are they looking at? Arguably, they're looking at this. This is the central block. It's two women supporting one another physically, but also emotionally. We can see the, sort of, the empty, anguished look on this woman's face. She's looking, she's looking upwards, heavenwards, perhaps for inspiration or just staring into the distance cradling the other woman in her hands or in her arms and we see the second woman here her head bowed with exhaustion with despair taking physical support and comfort from the person she's with and then what's happening in the background we can't in this image see what's to, just to the to sort of like the middle behind them but if we look to the right hand side we can see a woman her fist is clenched or is it clenched we'll see when we get closer up but what's she looking at or who is she looking at? She's looking at him. So we see this figure, but look, look, look behind him first. We've got faces trapped somewhere in something that's broken down, but hemming them in. And our man here is still partly attached, but he's also freeing himself. He's striving to pull away. What does this signify? He's striving towards her. Now, look for a moment and let's look at her face closely. You'll notice that the forehead, the eyes, the nose, they're all quite clearly defined. But if you look at her ear, it almost looks like um, cauliflower ear or it's indistinguishable. It wasn't like that a few years ago, but that's because this stone is designed to, er to erode naturally over time. And Hunsinger's idea was that 
this monument, this memorial, this sculpture would would erode over time, much as memories do erode over time as, as time passes and people pass. So that's why you can see, you know, the, this memorial isn't, this sculpture isn't maintained. It's left, you know, it gets it gets covered in moss and whatever else here. So that's why she has a greenish face. And also the birds do their own artistic um, additions, shall we call them. Um, so in this particular instance, you know, there's bird poo everywhere. Um, but it's, it's, it's there because memorials are in here and now. They're not, there's not someone going around every day cleaning it. It's just left to the elements. And we might want to think about that a little bit more and about why. And as I said, you know, her career is still not wonderfully defined there. This is a picture from four years earlier. But what we can see, again, she's surrounded by symbolism, but she's beckoning. That hand is curled as if they come to me, come here. I want to protect you. So she's trying to, she's symbolizing that unity of intermarried couples. If we look at the reverse of those two blocks, then we can see there's a hand here on the top left hand side. What does that symbolize? Is that is that a hand trying someone trying to escape? Is that a hand? Is it, is it dying? Below, we've got two smaller figures, presumably children. Again, if you look, you see sort of sadness on their face huddled together in solidarity. And then we have an inscription, 1943. And what it basically says is the power of disobedience overcomes the power of the dictatorship. And then onto the next block, we've got this sort of quasi-crucifixion image. So we've got Judeo-Christian imagery here with our man here, our emaciated man, his ribcage protruding, but his hands held up partly, partly as if he's straining away, but partly as if he's um, being crucified. Above it, we've got the words, give us our husbands back, which is reputedly what the protesters shouted at the guards. And then it says, women stood here, death defying, and Jewish men were free. Why is this on the stone? And why is that the inscription? What is it telling us? Hang on a second. And then we come to the final section. This is our man on a bench. And it's a funny little anecdote. Way back when I started um, this PhD, or as, as it was then, I had some not quite so good photographs. And I was looking at them in the office with some of my office mates. And I said, yeah, but what does, you could see him. He was really, really small in, the, in this photograph. I said, and what about this bit here? And my friend went, my office mate went, oh, that's just a man on a bench. And I thought, oh yeah, you're right. I've obviously misremembered. That's not part of the sculpture, but he is. He's very much a part of the sculpture, but he's set apart. So why is he set apart? What is he looking at? What does that distance symbolize? Then look again and look behind him. You've got a, you've got a building behind you. That is the building that replaced the former Jewish community building. It's a series of offices. So what is it like for the people who work in there to work in a space where there's this weight of history where they look out and see and see this scene going on see how people interact with this with this particular site it's quite interesting when you go around and you you stand there and you watch how tourists or just visitors interact interact with it um, and then of course here's a close-up of his face and i'd just like to thank that bird for the strategic bird poo teardrop um but we just thought we'd show you this to show that you know the, the memorials they're not sort of sanctified um untouchable unengageable being rather that um they're there in the here and now and they're part of our everyday and how we and how nature engage with them is something that we can reflect on and think about and try and understand so i'm going to pause it the pictures there for a minute because I'll be really interested to hear your thoughts in the Q&A about what all this memorial mean, all these sculptures mean, what things you see that perhaps I don't come at it with different eyes, you see different things. I know every time I've been to that memorial I see different things, things I hadn't spotted before because there's so much in there. But what I'd like to do at this point is put forward an idea 
about the sculpture and about the events it represents and its hidden history, um, that its history is hidden and simultaneously sort of submerged, but it's there if we look at it and read it in context. I would suggest that what Hunsinger was doing with his sculpture is critiquing remembrance culture. So remembrance culture in the GDR, but perhaps also remembrance culture of Germany um, as a unified state. And particularly the tendency to mourn the German, that is the non-Jewish loss. If we think to those outlying, about those outlying blocks, we've got the musician on the left-hand side and our man on the bench on the right-hand side. They're looking, the, the musician is looking away and the man is looking on at perhaps what has already passed. Um, and there is perhaps a sense that they are mourning, mourning their loss, not the loss of Jewish life, but in music, representing culture, the loss of Jewish contribution to German culture, if you like. So perhaps that is what Hunsinger was critiquing. In a broader context as well, if we think about the reverse of those bigger blocks, um, Hunsinger was reminding the visitor that even though a small number of people survived the Holocaust and there was this protest which did possibly or possibly didn't um, enable those inside Wozenstrasse to survive, but we can never detach that history from its broader history. We can never forget about the Holocaust that was going on around it and that even whilst people were protesting on the streets for this for these individuals, no one else was protesting against the far greater number who were being deported. And in a way, Hansinger's memorial sort of anticipates later historiographical trends, but again, we'll come to that into the, in the Q&A if there's more time. And yet there's also a GDR aspect that, um, or this the fact that the history of, of this memorial's development and the role of the GDR in that um, is perhaps significant in the protest remembrance, but this is an aspect that is overlooked and forgotten. And in a way, I'd like to suggest that Rosenstrasse is potentially a microcosm for, a, for the wider patterns of remembering the memorialization in Berlin generally. If we kind of go out of Rosenstrasse just for a minute, just indulge me, um, and we go a few streets away, um, we've now got the almost it's possibly now finished um, city palace or replacement building um, for the palace that was once there and then destroyed. But on that site, there was the East German regime's Palast der Republik or Palace of the Republic. And it, it became an iconic building associated with the GDR uh, that then got um, taken down and, rem uh, and, and removed. But the palace that's in its place just over, it, it's, it obliterates any trace of that GDR past. In, in fairness, there, there is reference to it buried within the basement of the of the new palace, so I believe. But it, again, it's not visible to the viewer, to the visitor just walking past. So my question is, is the GDR's past being written out to a certain extent? And is Wozenstrasse then perhaps um, representative, a smaller representative of that greater whole? That's something to perhaps mull over. Now, when Hunsinger's um, sculpture was unveiled in 1995, uh, it was, the events themselves weren't as well known as they are today. And one of the criticisms of her memorial was that um, no one would know what it was about. Now, you could take the line that, well, it's art, it's interpretive. So really, do you need something that tells you what to think what is this, what is about this. And you might also think there's quite a lot of symbolism in there. People can work it out. As a sort of means of um, going against that critique or, or, or redressing that critique, the um, hotel owner Wolfgang Locke, who owns the hotel and also the office buildings, was very conscious of wanting to um, make that past very present and to, 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 to honour that past, to honour what happened in the street, to honour the women's protest and the suffering of those in Rosenstrasse. And so he commissioned the memorial plaque you can now see on your screen. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will have already noticed that that same picture I showed you earlier, Abraham Pisarek's photo of Rosenstrasse, forms half of that plaque. And below is a short description of the events in their wider context. 
And what we have here, and this is where photography plays a part in constructing this narrative, is, is that use of photography to help jolt you out of the everyday so you could walk past and see that and suddenly you can be transported back into an earlier point of time. It disrupts the everyday and it makes Rosenstrasse, that seemingly insignificant street, um, into what Pierre Nora has called a lieu de memoir or a site of a site of memory. And it helps you to sort of visualize what, what happened here to imagine another world. Now and following year, so that Wolfgang Locke put that up in 1998. And then the following year in the March of 1999, the Topography of Terror Museum um, installed this uh, advertising column. Now you'll remember if we look back just to that previous slide, I talked about these advertising columns. They use the same style, they, they research the style of, of Litfasol or advertising column and use this as the basis for their exhibition stroke their memorial. And dotted on there, we have numerous images. So we've got what you can't, you can't quite see in this image is that's a station, that's Grunewald station um, and put its porkers around the other side, stations from which deportations of Berlin Jews took place. Now the photographs are actually post-war photographs, but perhaps their usage there is not just sort of practical, this is a photograph we have that's approximately the right time, but also it's alluding to that sort of absence is that, so if you've read Roland Barthes' comments on um, discussion on photography, you talk about you know photographs being there to provide an absence of what is no longer here, but what has passed. And if you read sort of JJ Long's works, he also talks about photographs gaining meaning from their context. So what you have where you don't have photographs is you have testimonies, one of which is actually fictional masquerading as fact, even though it was known to the museum at the time that this is a fictional account. Um, but you also have um, deportation lists you've got down here. You have testimony of survivors. You have testimony of um, Nazis or accounts from um, serving Nazi officers at that time. And key among there, then is this image. So it's that repeated image of being in the street at the time. But what you will notice in comparison to um, Ingeborg Hunsinger's sculpture is this little bit here on the right hand side, left hand side, sorry, terrible left right confusion. Um, you can see it's peeling away. Um, that's because this sculpture is maintained, this memory is maintained by the topography of terror. Those, that, that, those pictures are pasted on in the same way that advertising hoarding was pasted on back in the day they're done they're done every put on that every three to four months so this is a maintained memory because it gets weather beaten and battered and so that's then becomes a, a draw for people to come to the street and to learn more about the event obviously that is for only people who speak german there isn't any english translation on there and that led as well to the excavation of the foundations of the old the former synagogue, the Alta Synagogue, which you can then see here um, in this information board. And you've got a little description and that's in English, French, um, German, obviously, and Russian. So this process that began with Ingeborg Hunsinger's memorial has allowed various histories, overlapping histories, different histories to come to the surface and to be, to be remembered and to take form part of the cityscape. And what you can see here in this image is the um, the foundations of the synagogue that were just they're just there, so that the, the Jewish past can be commemorated. Now, remember as well that I said about that criticism of the memorial that there was not enough to explain what it was. That again has been redressed, and we have a number of these glass information boards here, again using photography to help legitimise the narrative. Um, and to show its continuity. So we've got a picture of a commemoration speech down there. And this tells you uh, what a one interpretation of what that memorial means. And it tells you that in German and in English. Um, so we might think about this, we've perhaps got a shift towards a more didactic remembering, instructing on what you should think and taking that, that agency away from the individual. So there's lots of 
development over sort of the last sort of 25 years or so, I haven't done the maths, um, in the street. And it is a veritable site of memory with, you can spend quite a lot of time in there just unpacking things. But that leads me to the question, and I'm sort of wrapping this up, of whose memory is it anyway? You know, we're talking, we're talking about, I've used terms here like Jewish memory, German memory, but actually, does it belong to any of us at all? And how do we interact with that space? It's a public space after all. Um, and as I say, I spent quite a bit of time there um, and I like to kind of observe what's going on or I get talking to people. And back in 2016, when I was there, I, um, I was waiting, actually, I've, I've gone there partly to take photographs for my book. And I was sat there waiting for what ultimately became the money shot, as I call it, because it's on the cover of my book. And I was waiting for ages because there was a couple and they'd sat down on the bench with our stone man. And they were having their lunch and having a lovely little chat and cuddled up together. And the man then reached over and grabbed our stone man on the knee, gave it a squeeze and went, hmm, schönebeiner, or hmm, lovely legs. At which point I'm thinking, well, you know, can you grope a sculpture? Is this acceptable behaviour? But then who am I? to say what is and isn't acceptable you know is there it should there be a prescribed way of how you engage with with memorials or not does it really matter should I have gone over and told him ultimately I decided no I was really just wanting them to to move because I wanted a clear shot and I got I got my wish in the end but it's had it's been sort of mulling over in my mind ever since and then, of course, we, in a second, we're going to look at a few snapshots in time that I hope will lead to a productive discussion. But I also, before I do that, want to raise one more sort of question that around how the narrative might be being reshaped at the present time. Because in Germany, you've got the rise of the RFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, which is the populist right party. And they're very interested in the Rosenstrasse narrative. And a few years ago, um, at the annual commemorative speech, I analysed I analyzed that speech. And it seems to suggest to me that in an attempt not to let the RFD um, challenge the, the memory of the Wars and Strides to take it over and manipulate it for their own purposes, as they tried to do with the legacy of the 20th of July assassination attempt on Hitler, that actually those that are involved in the protest commemoration have inadvertently let themselves be influenced by them and have offered a kind of very reduced, simplistic um, remembering of Rosenstrasse. But perhaps, again, we can flesh that out in the discussions because I want to give us plenty of time. We've just got a couple more images to go and then I'll hand over to Simona. Um, this is a shot from 2016. Again, our man on the bench, he was, it was quite useful for lots of photography. Um, more than I realised when I was taking the photographs. And you can see on that right hand side that there is a newspaper and there's a book. You can't quite see from this angle what that book says, but you've got a translation down there about Islam confronts, uh, condemns terrorism. So what's that doing there? I don't know the story. I happened to see it. It was left there and I thought, take a photograph. It's a snapshot. What's going on? But it raises these questions of how do we engage with a public memorial space? Do people see it as a memorial? This is consecrated Jewish ground. What's the is there a religious symbolism to that being left there? We don't know. It's another hidden history that we're not necessarily able to unearth. And then at the same time as going around the memorials, I noticed this. You might have seen this on one of the earlier photographs of the, of the big blocks. This is one of the what's supposed to be one of the death marks, as I understand it death masks, sorry. But you'll notice in this picture, the eyes are in blue. They've been coloured in or drawn in. Perhaps this is a reference to alluding to the Nazi ideal Aryan, you know, the blue eyes, they haven't actually pasted on blonde hair. But there's a reference there. Why are they doing that? This is, is it, is it a way of amplifying the GDR past that people perhaps think is being forgotten, or is it critiquing the GDR past? Is it just vandalism? Again, we don't know. There are different stories there, but it's showing that people are engaging with memorials in a different way. And this is my last image. Again, you'll recall this is the image of the protesters. 
and but what you will notice if you zoom in is two of them at least have had Hitler moustaches drawn on them. Why have they had them drawn on them? How do we respond to this? Is this anti-Semitic graffiti? Is it someone having a pop? Is it just someone having a very, perhaps, uh, just having a joke, but a very ill thought through one? Who did it? We don't, we don't know. But it all raises questions about history um, and how, how we understand it. But it's also about who controls the narrative. We could just condemn this as an act of graffiti, as an act of violence against the memorial. And we could stand in sort of indignation like, at the fact that people have done this. But let's remember also, this isn't a grave. This is a sculpture. This is a piece of art. It's not the same as desecrating a grave, perhaps. But so I come back to that question, who controls the narrative? And this is, I think, where it links into the here and now. Because who controls the history we learn and how we understand our past and ourselves as a result? This is these are the questions that we can ask, that we can use photography to ask and to look at history and the process of history to ask. And as we think about these past events, let's also think about who controls the narrative of the events we're living through now. And what will people in the future understand and what does that say about us? I'd like to stop there. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over to Simona, who's now going to, to pose some questions, and then we're going to open the floor uh, for further questions. Thank you very much. Simona, over to you. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, I have a few questions, I guess, that relate to your uh, presentation and also as you were talking uh, about the kind of coming into being uh, of the site and also uh, the photography uh, of the uh, various sculptures. So one of the questions I have, and we can answer them uh, after each question or open it up to the floor, it's up to you, but one relates to the microgeography and conceptions of micro time as instructive memory actions or engagements mm -hmm. without formal commemoration reminders, because as you said, tomorrow is the 78th um, anniversary. So I was interested in uh, memory and remembrance outside of these regular markers and what is the kind of function of, I guess, the site in its everyday space and engagements. How do you kind of conceive, have, have you researched, I guess, the kind of the everyday history outside of the commemoration frameworks? Yes, largely. I mean, it's it's often there's 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 sort of two arguments, if you like, that um, you know that that having these memorials and particularly things like the, the advertising columns that are, are very similar to the way they are now, but just ever so slightly different, that they jolt you out of the everyday. So there's this sort of raising of social consciousness that goes that goes with them, and it makes you stop. You might be hurrying through that street, you know, taking a shortcut. Um, and you're confronted with the past rather than having to actively remember it because there's, you know, there's also that argument that says that there's nothing as invisible as a memorial where you're not, you know, and when you when you attend a memorial, do you think in a certain way because you feel obliged to think in a certain way? So in a sense, it, it disrupts your every day. There's another argument that Jennifer A. Jordan posits. She says, she, you know, you can walk through Rosenstrasse and you can not notice it. So you can engage with the past but it's, it has to be a choice, I think, to engage with the past in that in that in that particular street. Um, you might just be, you know, disinterested and opt not to. And I suppose that's also a case of that's your right to choose whether to engage in a past. We can't we can't force you to. No one can force you to confront the past. Um, it's it's a matter of individual agency, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and my other question related, I guess, to. Um, you mentioned the GDR and its particular almost displacement from the site in a way. Um, could you elaborate on that some more? Because um, I know I read your article from German Life and Letters that you published last year in which you talked about kind of an enthusiastic support using memorialization to leverage kind of foreign policy, so to speak, mm -hmm. as the GDR So yeah. um, at the time. But what do you see as this kind of displacement uh, at the moment of the GDR, or the former GDR, obviously, but um, can you elaborate yeah. on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, 
just to sort of point a few things so to point out what you're saying about the sort of the wider context of the GDR in the 1980s um, was effectively a bankrupt state and it was sort of in hoc trying to get money to survive and um, one so Mario Kessler in particular I was and also Paula Doherty argued that uh, basically the East German state was going to America to into America and other nations to try and get money and it used it engaging with its Jewish past as leverage for that because previously sort of narratives of the Jewish past have been subsumed under the sort of the communist heritage of the state and sort of communist resistance but cynically the state then made overtures towards the Jewish community and started investing in in, in sort of engaging with the Jewish past running memorial competitions and so on in attempt to look good when they went to the states to ask for money so it was a very cynical ploy on the part of the state um, and I just think that um, and, and obviously it's enabled various memorials to happen and this one in particular um, but I know many memorials at the time that were that were in sort of preparation in the, in the former GDR then didn't end up being installed post unification so there are suppose questions why Rosenstrasse captures the imagination perhaps more than more than others but I just think potentially, you know, there's so much going on in that site that we are losing, that we can't necessarily maintain all of the, all of the histories um, or make those, those visible. And so the DDR is being lost. And it's not just actually in memorialization that we find this, because I've looked at the various different representations of this protest. And there's a, what we call a popular history account. And the first version was written as a sort of, piece of young adult literature, so aimed for sort of like older teens to early adults. And the way this narrative was constructed um, differs from, from its later version. So it talked about another resistance group who were involved, very much a left-leaning, the, the Herbert Baumgruppe, um, very much a kind of communist associated resistance group. Um, and they talked about the various different activities they, that they did. And then as time went on and this book was republished and it was then rewritten as a sort of history with the story attached um it this narrative changed around this particular group the sort of the east german dimension was sort of lost and it became much more like the narrative of the of the white rose it just talked about the pamphleteering and it parallels the, the sort of the narrative of the the vice laws of the munich student resistance group who were caught and executed just before this protest actually took place. So I, I have. It's just my sort of sense as I'm looking at things that that that, that the Nazi past and the Jewish past is being quite rightly remembered, but the Jewish past is, or, or the GDR past rather is being kind of forgotten. That that a lot of the, and a lot of the memories of Rosenstrasse have come from come from the GDR. It was activity in the GDR that that meant that commemoration happened. The fact that we have an annual ceremony is down to the then East German Jewish community who initiated it and um, held out the proverbial olive branch across the Berlin Wall to their West German counterparts and invited them over to what was then East Berlin. And this ceremony has, has gained and built ever since. Well, thank you. Um, it's very interesting also because of what you said of that displacement, you know, mirrors other kind of practices. Uh, as well of how do you kind of I guess write a commemoration history of where does the GDR kind of fit into that um, I guess as well it's just a comment um, my first my kind of final question I want to take you back to where the kind of earlier part of your talk um, mm -hmm. where I'm the main theme is uh, I want to raise is photographic practice uh, mm -hmm. of you and your partner Mark as fac facilitating a critical culture of remembering so when I look at these photographs and their composition, I respond to them as inviting a certain kind of companionship that mm -hmm. evokes the threat of separation of German women from the Jew German husbands, Jewish husbands. And I'm reminded of themes of inclusion and exclusion, participation and passivity, activism and intervention. And so in doing so, I read your practice of photography and that of your partner, Mark, as criticism as its own memorial work. And I'm also reminded of the recent collection of essays called Resisting Persecution, Jews and Their Petitions During the Holocaust, where various authors examined how the role of individual and collective petitions were used to push back against persecution by the Nazi regime. 
and one, in fact, there's a chapter that you might find of interest on post-war intermarriage. So I see your work as a form of petitioning against memory, dilution or effacement. So what kinds of anxieties do you think that these memorials such as um, the Women's Block and Rosenstrasse symbolise about current and future memory trends? Because you mentioned in your article, you're really on the lookout for 2023, you know, to see what mm. happens there as the major, you know, the 80th anniversary, um, so to speak, a potential a flashpoint um, of um, kind of co-option in a way of the narrative, perhaps by the AFD or other organisations. So could you comment more about, I guess, the philosophy of your engagement, um, for yeah. philosophical and uh, visual practice with the memorial site? Yes, certainly. I, mean, I think if we if we focus more on first of all on that sort of what I'm looking at and sort of anticipating as we're coming towards the 80th anniversary in a couple of years' time, um, I wonder whether there's going to be this narrative this this narrative of wars and is we're going to become very reduced, very functional, um, and sort of going through the sort of historiography of the protest as as, as sort of more research has been done. It sort of pivoted from this narrative which really emphasizes heroism and you know call questions what was resistance was resistance was this successful and that was the measure by which it was judged and where, where it's kind of popularly believed and to be and then historical arguments that actually question that narrative and say firstly you know the protest was a remarkable act and it should be honored as such but it shouldn't be decontextualized and we shouldn't forget that far fewer people protested than didn't and that people you know thousands hundreds, well millions of people we know died because there was no there was no protest um i also want to find out more about the demographics if you like of the protest because we know that actually there were men involved in the protest not just in Rosenstrasse but a few streets away in Gorsa Hamburger Straße which is say, about a five minute walk um away where in that instance there are more Jewish intermarried women who were detained and their husbands gathered outside but that narrative has always been crowded out by this narrative of women's success this women successfully defying the regime and that brings in ideas about you know the loyal German woman um, that she's effectively apolitical because she's there fighting for her loved one she's fighting for her, her her husband her children and doesn't have a political role and I think this is what the RFD might try and capitalize on and have this very simplistic narrative that honours great Germanness, she says in, in inverted commas, sort of sidelines any critical history of, of that, the, the histories that sort of say, you know, we don't, you know, it, it, the, the histories that question whether the protest was a success or whether there was a different plan um, that the Nazis had and whether the protest actually had any direct impact at all. So we get this, this potential reduction of history. And I think that's really important. We look to Poland recently and the recent rule it went where, you know, there, there were demands for historians to apologize for their Holocaust histories, that who is controlling the narrative and, you know, about, it's about the freedom to research and freedom of expression, I think, is, is an area of concern going forward. And then sort of with the phot photographic practice, um, it's looking at sort of finding ways to kind of capture how people engage. You know, I was when I first turned up at the street and I saw this, I was quite I was quite taken aback and in a way quite angry, partly because obviously I was thinking of oh, I need some more photos for my book and I didn't initially want to photograph like this in my book. It is actually in there. Um, but then I thought, well, you know, this is this says something about what's going on now and perhaps these memorials, as others before them, are a site where frustrations or statements are kind of meted out against the memorial. Um, so we don't know, you know, Mark, we were discussing this earlier, Mark's suggesting, well, maybe, you know, it might be some drunk Brit that's over in Berlin that thought it'd be a jolly jape to put some Hitler moustaches on, on these, on these memorials, kind of decontextualise and just think that's, that's quite funny. But in a German context, the response to that would be different, um, because it's much more loaded um, in Germany than obviously than it is necessarily in the UK. So it's, it's using those images to kind of question I suppose and to, and to ask questions but also to not just get stuck down a kind of moral path where we just say this is wrong we actually say well why is this happening what are people saying and why do people choose memorials as ways of expressing 
their beliefs, their ideas, um, as opposed to any other any other form. Why are they attacking? Are they attacking this memorial? And and why? What does that tell us? So I don't necessarily have an answer to that, but I think it's interesting to see how people engage with it differently. And I would quite like to sort of in a non-pandemic time do sort of some ethnographic observations and spend quite a lot of time in the street and talk to people who are engaging with the memorial and find out why they're talking about it. I mean, I had a lovely conversation back last January when we were there. There was a group of teachers with the who were on a sort of a, a, a course with the Goethe Institute and they have been sent off um, to look at various sites in Berlin and of course Strasse was one of them. So we had this really lovely conversation. Mark sort of shoved me towards them and said, talk to them, because I was thinking, no, I'm going to respect your space. And um, and then we just they were fascinated with it. And it's it's sort of joyous in a way to see how people are fascinated um, by the past and have all these questions about it and find it truly remarkable. Yeah, I mean, I went to the Berlin with students a few years ago. We went to the German, the resistance center. Yes. Um, and that was a bit um, kind of basic, I thought, uh, mm. as well, in terms of that, um, how those histories are represented. It, it tried to do a panorama of resistance uh, demographics, mm. so to speak. But I didn't really find it that uh, particularly enlightening, I guess. Yeah, I think it depends on where the memorialization has come from, whether it's sort of state down or whether it's kind of um, citizen initiative sort of upwards. Um, and because obviously the, 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 the sculpture was a, a private initiative, ultimately that was state funded, but came from an individual. And the history behind that is a bit ambiguous. Some people say, you know, Hunsinger said she wanted this, uh, some a sculpture, but then it's kind of vague as to how she came across the protest. She herself was um, a child of intermarried parents, but um, she wasn't, she wasn't um, arrested and detained as part of the, or, or, or her parents weren't involved in the protest. So it was not really very clear how she came to it. But it, ultimately, all of those memorials come in one degree or another from a citizens initi initiative. And indeed, the topography of terror that, that um, created that column, that project in its set, the, the original project for the topography of terror resulted from a citizens initiative in the late 1980s, late 1980s, I'm going to get the date wrong, um, where they excavated the site um, that was a sort of former Gestapo um, interrogation Center and that's become a sort of state-run memorial, state, there's state-level involvement, but it all stems from Citizens Initiative um, back in the 80s. Yeah, it was successful democratic engagement yeah. kind of in action. Yeah, so I mean that ends my question, so I'm happy to open it up uh, if James Lovely. wants to come back into uh, member uh, other attendees. So thank you very much, Ellery. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Simone. And perhaps yes, let's open it out. If there are any questions that um, everyone would like to ask, either in the chat or um, orally, uh, but if you could put your hand up, perhaps, um, and we can take it from there. And there is already a question here I can see um, on the uh, chat. Can you see that OK? Um, I'm from... getting it's coming up. I think Joseph's got his hand up. Joseph, do you want to come in first? And then I can have a look at Ruth's comment. Joseph, are you still there? I think he may have left, actually. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry, I'm just trying to turn on my... OK. Fire away. Can you see me? OK, yes. Uh, I can so hear I'm... you, I can't see you. Oh, OK. So I find it quite interesting, um, the difference between this memorial and the memorial down the road at the um, Memorial for the Murder Jews of Europe. Um, so the, there's a huge contrast in terms of the way that that is displayed and the way that this this one is, because that one's just completely blank and just completely um, flat um, blocks. Whereas this one, there's a lot more character. You can see the people as as humans. You can they're all individually identifiable, and I just find that contrast very interesting. I'm just wondering if perhaps you. Um, I suppose you think that this one is perhaps more effective in getting across the idea of humanity or, or perhaps um, conversely whether the other one is, um, brings across more ideas of inhumanity, I suppose. I don't know, I think I haven't really actually thought about it now. It's an interesting way to sort of juxtapose, juxtapose the two. I suppose they're coming 
coming from sort of different places, the, the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe was the result, obviously, of a political a political initiative, but the result of a you know huge huge international competition. Um, and what's noticeable about the Holocaust, the, 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 the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe, is that actually, if you go round, there's those little plaques which kind of they kind of direct how you should behave. And obviously, we know that people don't. We know that people kind of climb all over them and they've got pictures of people taking selfies and I think people try to you know do gymnastics on those on those um sort of stones which you don't get here so there's there's a kind of prescriptiveness to the to that memorial that that that, that is absent absent here whether they're more effective I suppose is is an individual mm. um thing and it's really interesting to see how different people engage with with different memorials and what they see and what they're expecting to kind of get out of them or what they bring to it but thank you i have to think thank about you. that a bit more thank you um ruth i'm just looking at your comment and then ella do you want did ella just flash a hand up do you want to come in um yeah sure sorry just gonna shut my door um i was thinking about you talking about how the the philosopher figure was looking away and it immediately mm -hmm. made me think of uh, hannah arendt's work on yep on sort of like the viva activa and also like the banality of evil and things like that and how she didn't want to be known as a sort of philosopher but a theorist because she thought a philosopher was too much of a sort of passive role um and I was wondering if what you thought about that maybe it was like reference to that or or it, I don't know if it had any link at all um it possibly does have a reference I hadn't thought of it about that I was thinking of it more of um sort of the sort of the philosopher is perhaps um what they would call a fellow traveler of the regime who went along with it he's turned a blind eye because he's looking what you can't necessarily even see from the photos that i've got there is that he's looking away from all the activity that's going on in those other blocks he's looking in the opposite direction so i think it's turning a blind eye so again i think it's possibly one of those criticisms that huntinger had of the way the, the, the jewish the holocaust was engaged with or rather not engaged with um in in sort of post-war germany in the two germanys and in and in unified germany so it's that that consciously choosing not to see maybe but it's open it's open for you know debate it's 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 i see this as a memorial but also a work of art and art is subjective and it and it sort of should be subjective so perhaps there is a, a link to our event there and that she's referencing so thank you um ruth so you're saying um, about the palimpsest uh, and Islam reminds you of an intertext um, by my old Leeds colleague, Max Silverman. Yeah, uh, a, a Holocaust and the Algerian war conflicts of decolonization. Uh, I'm just trying to read really, really quickly. Um, yeah, I have, I have thought about, I, I need to think about sort of, you know, perhaps there's a decolonization angle to think of here as well that I need to, I need a bit of time to look into. Um, and the choice of advertising column, yeah, so it's sort of, it does have that kind of multiple meaning within it, but also the commodification of memory um, that the memorials and maybe photography are caught up with. Yeah, because there is, in, uh, at one point in the 90s, there was this claim that, you know, all these memorials are talking about the disnification of, of uh, sort of Berlin with all, it's sort of on a memorial sort of scale, that there's so much, there's so much memorialization going on there that, you know, it also attracts tourists so there is there is an ethical question in there isn't there about how they're being used and it's drawing drawing tourism in and and do we have a right to profit from it but then if we don't put something up there if there is nothing that marks that past and it's being forgotten and that's also that's also highly problematic yeah i was kind of wondering whether uh, you know joe's question there about the um the memorial and also thinking about the Libreskind. um Jewish Museum, whether whether those two are actual uh, might be further layers to your palimpsest and they kind of go on top, if you like, and they occlude Rosenstrasse because they're I'm famous sure. or, or, or then there must be some kind of competitive competition for, for, for kind of memorial space and in in Berlin. Yeah, and the, the Rosenstrasse has um it, it, the, by just by dint of its location it is in the center whereas the jewish Liebeskind museum is a little bit a little bit out um so i think yeah there is a sort of competition for memorial space and there's a lot that's sort of 
almost crammed in Holzenstrasse because it's so 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 small. But also, it's actually found its way out into other exhibitions. So in the Topography of Terror's on-site um, exhibition um, over sort of a bit further out in Berlin, it's integrated into that exhibition as well. And it's also integrated into the exhibition in the um, uh, the, the Neue Synagoge, the Honoranienburger Straße. So it's it's sort of it's physically present and symbolically present in the Rosenstrasse, but it's also elsewhere. Right. Um, so yes, I think I think more about the palimpsest. I think and have a reread of Max. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? We have five more minutes, and I'm sure the speakers, in fact, I, I know that Hilary and Simone are very happy to go on a little bit more. There's a question from Barbara. Uh, Barbara, would you like to ask? Um, yep. So, hello, Hilary, and thank you very much for this really interesting talk. Um, I apologize for being in black and white. Um, I've actually got mm -hmm. two questions for you. Maybe I missed it at the beginning, but. Yeah. Um, what what initially drew you to that site and and why did you sort of um decide to to work on the commemoration of rosenstrasse so i'd be interested in in hearing more about that and then i'm really intrigued i mean i really loved the way you presented um aspects of that memorial site and that you gave us the chance to make up our own minds um about that commemoration but do you personally think that it is a fitting memorial whatever fitting is, but your very personal view um, for that kind of protest. Thank you. Thank you. They're good questions, Barbara. Thank you. As to why, um, as I've discovered with all kind of research that I've done, I slightly fell into this, and that seems to be where success. If I search for a topic, I don't find it, and if I find them by accident. I was very interested as a, when I was doing my undergraduate dissertation on sort of German resistance to Nazism and actually I read some a very short bit about the protests back then um, but didn't really didn't really sink in and then I left and I went to Munich and I was teaching in Munich and I started reading around um, for my PhD and sort of had I had a slightly different topic but still still to do with memories of resistance and my topic was really just too broad so once I started my PhD I started reading more about it and my sort of hook in was through the history um and um and sort of I was fascinated by this initially by this debate of well was the protest a success and or was it not and the, as I was writing that there was quite a big historical debate going on um the quite contentious debate over over the meaning of the protest and and, and what it actually you know what its effect was if we can measure measure that and so I just I looked at all the different ways that that the protest had been represented and I think memorialization is so is so fascinating partly because there's the struggle to get this memorialized as I said it very nearly um just didn't didn't happen um and it's only because you know once once one thing happens then it leads to the others and there's so much that you can sort of read into these memorials that that I come back and I think about things and you so I read if I read the article that I wrote a few years ago actually 10 years ago I think um, I might disagree with myself now, but also memorials are such a good way of getting people talking because they're, you know, they're, they're ways of, you can have conversations across cultural boundaries. There, there, there's not the language barrier that there is, say, to some of the literature or the film that's never been released in the UK, um, that if you speak German, you can, you, can, you can watch the film, that's fine. And it was released in the States, but there's no version that plays on a UK DVD player. So memorialization is is something that you can access irrespective of of language um, potential or constraints. And my personal view, I don't know if there is a way to adequately um, represent. I would, as as I was sort of saying, I'm really interested in actually the makeup of who was involved in the protest and the, and the gender dimensions and the fact that I think that. The idea of men protesting has been sort of left out of the narrative a little bit, sort of or just sort of pushed to the margins. And I would like to see some more about that. And there's also a question of whether actually other people, so who weren't didn't have relatives in in Horsenstrasse, but were intermarried themselves, perhaps um, perhaps also came along. 
that's something I was asked a while ago by by the daughter of of someone who was someone who's on the kinder transport who but whose mother was in Berlin and the family story goes that she attended the protest even though her children were in England and she was she was in Berlin and her husband had actually escaped to Shanghai um, but we've not been able to prove it so I don't know if there's a a way that you can adequately represent but I'd like to know more and perhaps it's, it's tying in with that comment that James E. Young made of, about the best memorial is actually having conversations um, and talking about it that's the the best way to honour rather than a, than a than a piece of stone thank you um John I'm just coming to your comment so the thing that intrigues you is a sort of soft stone and the suggestion more might be change fade like memories that it's doing something different to commemoration and also how long will it actually survive yeah I suppose in, in from what I understand of Ingeborg Hunsinger didn't give too much information about this and I actually wanted to interview her but she she declined um so it sort of works a little bit of it is 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 guesswork but I think she was thinking of the the longevity of of, of a particular memory um and that it will that inevitable there's an inevitability that memory will fade over time but also I think we can see in there the fact that memory changes over time the way these events are remembered has has changed over the decades and in a sense the memorial then is perhaps going to change with it and that's part of the artistic concept um how long will it actually survive I think that's um, down to a number of factors, be they, they sort of environment, um, environmental ones, how much of a battering it takes in the Berlin winters. Um, I mean, it's been there since, I mean, it was it was started in the late 1980s and it's been on site since 90, late 1995 and we're now 2021. So I think it will be around for quite some time yet, but it's just going to be um, eroding more over time. I mean, maybe a decision will be made to, to sort of to reconstruct some of it or to preserve it. Um, that would be down to the sort of Berlin sort of Mitter um, local sort of government. Um, but certainly the conception is that it would it would um, erode. And perhaps it's a little bit like I don't know if you know much about the sort of the vanishing memorials that were sort of uh, a sort of thing in sort of like the late eighties. I think particularly in West Germany where over a period of time rather than this being the monument that again as people say you know there's nothing more invisible than a monument um that that people would engage it because this memorial just sank bit by bit into the ground so perhaps it's um a similarity with that that i've not really thought about until you mentioned it Yeah, it does. It does look quite ancient. Perhaps that's part of the part of the um, the concept as well, because it it's tracing this through it, it, with the references of Babylonian exile. It's also placing the Holocaust in its sort of longer historical historical context. But yeah, it does look does look quite ancient, and that's nothing to do with the photographs. That's all to do with the stone. Okay. Are there any final questions for? Hilary uh, and of course uh, Simone or comments. No, I think I think we're probably good. Can I just thank everyone for for attending and for listening so so well and for the comments and the questions. I really do do appreciate it. Well, thank you, Hilary, and, and thanks, Simone, and thank, uh, thanks everyone for coming and for the excellent questions. Um, it was uh, a really important and far-reaching talk that you gave, um, especially with the images that you provided um, for those who are able to get to Berlin tomorrow. Uh, we'll all be thinking, obviously, about the protest um, tomorrow on the 78th anniversary. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for the contribution. Uh, the recording of the um, event will be available. Let's give it a week. It's going to be on the YouTube channel. 
with the Centre for Visual Cultures uh, very shortly, and then it'll go on, migrate to the um, Centre for Visual Cultures at Royal Holloway website. You can Google that and you'll get straight onto the website. And on that um, uh, posting, we'll also have um, some details of Mark's blog as well and information about his photography, I hope. Um, as well as um, Hillary's blog. So there'll be a sort of chance, a kind of hub there of information um, to support um, the, um, the talk and material that was discussed today. But I'd like to thank everyone then as everyone is leaving, just thanks everyone again for, for coming and um, see you again for the next event at the Centre for Visual Cultures. Now that you know where we are, we're a regular centre with um, our events, so please do come again uh, for those who are coming for the first time. Thank you, thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. I'll stay on to that Tom. <laughs>